Thank you all for joining us on this earning call of Bharti Intertel for the fourth quarter and the full year ended on 31st March. As you all know, the year gone by saw the Indian telecom industry undergoing an unprecedented consolidation in the wake of intense price war, uh, which has led to five operators ceasing to exist, <clears throat> either on account of mergers or outright shutdown of, operator, of operations in the last year. These include Tata's, Telenor, Arcom, MTS, and ASL. As a result, the TAR companies did see significant exits of co-locations from these operators. <clears throat> Due to this, we had a net loss of approximately 10,000 co-locations in fourth quarter, uh, which took the total tally of exits for the full year to approximately 22,000 on a consolidated basis. It is important to highlight that with, the, with these exits, the bulk of the adverse impact from consolidation, other than the impending impact of Boda Idea merger, is now behind us. As of 31st March 2018, the total consolidated tar base stood at 91,451 with co-locations at 206,000 approximately with a co-location factor of 2.25. A positive outcome of this consolidation of course has been that the fundamental structure of the Indian telecom industry which very clearly had to before was totally faulty and broken with 10 to 11 operators in each circle is now finally being corrected. With the Voda idea merger, the industry would be left with three private operators plus a government-owned operator in the form of BSNL and MTNL. I believe this is an ideal structure, a structure and with this, as well as the fact that the data demand is growing at a very rapid pace. Uh, for instance, in 2017, it grew by 144% in terms of data consumption as per the latest Nokia and the IT report. It is now clear that all three private operators will have to invest heavily in rolling out 4G across the country to remain competitive. In addition, in the longer term, we all know that advent of 5G would significantly increase the demand for sites because of the spectrum being in higher frequencies and also due to deployment of critical applications on IoT, which would require ubiquitous coverage. As a result, we at Bharti Infratel and Indus remain excited about the potential of our industry in India in times to come. Coming to the financial highlights on the quarter and the full year, our consolidated revenues at 14,490 crores grew 8% year on year. EBITDA improved to 6,427 crores, up 8%. EBIT improved to 4,034 crores, up 11% year on year. And operating peak of cash flow grew by 13% year on year to 4,202 crores. However, due to the loss of co locations during the year, and particularly the last quarter, the results for the quarter showed lower growth rates on a Y to Y basis. As a result, consolidated revenues at 3,662 for the quarter grew 4% by on Y. EBITDA was at 606 crore, uh, remaining more or less flat at 1% growth by Y. And the consolidated EBIT for the quarter was at 1,020 crores, up 2% year on year. Operating free cash flow is again more or less similar as last year, down 1% to 1,016 crores for the quarter. 
the ROC pre-tax and the return on investment post-tax remain strong at 34% and 15.4% respectively. The board has recommended uh, in its meeting yesterday a final dividend of rupees 14 per share for the financial year ended 31st March 2018, which is subject to shareholders' approval at the AGM. On the new revenue stream, uh, you remember we have spoken about smart city projects. Both Infratel and Indus are investing in smart city projects in a selective manner as pilots in Bhopal by Infratel and Vadodara by Indus. Both of these are in final stages of completion and commissioning. To conclude, we do expect some more short-term challenges in form of cancellation of co-locations, particularly due to the impending Voda idea of Marja. Of course, as yet, the timing for these remains uh, completely opaque because we do not know how the integration is going. However, with an improving industry structure of fuel operators, the rising consumer demand, and the need to densify networks through 4G in the short term and potentially 5G in the longer term, we do expect the industry to come out of this phase much stronger. And we believe that both Infratel and Indus are in best position, both in terms of operational expertise as well as financially to cater to the ever-increasing passive infrastructure demand of the telecom operators. Thank you. The management will take your questions now. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer interactive session for all the participants who are connected to the audio conference service from Airtel. Due to time constraints, we would request if you could limit the number of questions to two to enable more participation. Hence, management will take only two questions per participant to ensure maximum participation. Participants who wish to ask questions may please press star 1 on their touchstone enabled telephone keypad. On pressing star 1, participants will get a chance to present their questions on a first-in-line basis. To ask a question, participants may please press star 1 now. The first question comes from Mr. Sachin Salgaonkar from Bank of America, Mumbai. Mr. Salgaonkar, you may ask your question now. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. I have two questions. Uh, first question is regarding uh, optimal gearing structure. Now, Akhil, uh, thank you for the dividend. Uh, and clearly, by the looks of it, uh, you know, the payout of dividend appears to be a max out uh, from the retained earnings perspective. So just wanted to understand, uh, you know, what could be the optimal gearing structure for the company going forward, i.e. in a scenario even uh, if Indus is bought via a share swap, the combined company will still remain a net cash company. And second question is more on the lines of uh, the near-term demand for the industry. And again, by the looks of it, the supply is higher than demand. So we have 450 to 500,000 cars in India. And if you look at the individual needs of the three strong operators, I mean, Geo publicly has said 200K, Idea, Vodafone clearly are rationalizing, but, you know, I mean, eventually they could be anywhere between 180 to 220K, and Bharati today is around 160, 170K. So clearly, I mean, the supply is much higher than demand. Uh, in that scenario, we have someone like an ATC who lost a couple of its anchor tenants. Uh, so do we see a pricing pressure per se coming? And more importantly, where is the growth going to come in the near term? Thanks. Hi, Sachin. Uh, let me start by answering the second question first uh, in terms of supply versus demand. And this we have said earlier, too, that tower capacities are not fungible capacities. If there is a requirement, those requirements have to be met in. Uh, clearly, there are two aspects of growth. The first one led by coverage, where there is still rural parts of the country where we continue to see rollouts being done by leading operators. And second is more quality-led, where within the city there are infill sites required both for coverage and capacity reasons. 
both are being filled up as we speak. Yes, to a certain extent, there are towers which can be used where operators do use these up for filling up coverage gaps and there are new towers still being built. If you notice our own numbers that there is uh, new rollout numbers that are coming out in terms of new build of towers as we speak now too. Whether towers that have reached a zero tenant level on account of exits for uh, some of our competitors, those towers could potentially have other tenants in the neighborhood too. And hence, I wouldn't agree on the fact that, you know, the supply versus demand, there is an excess of supply there. The demand is in portions where it is needed, and clearly that's what is being filled by building in new towers. And wherever there is a co-location potential, that's the easiest thing to get covered up to. Uh, with GEO's uh, announcement of 210,000 towers, that's clearly showing up that the new normal is going to be north of 200,000 towers to an operator who's trying to compete in this post-consolidation scenario. And as you're aware, the leading operators in the past were somewhere between 140 to 160,000 tower locations that they were present on. Clearly means there is a further requirement of rolling out new towers also as we go forward. Uh, on gearing, uh, <clears throat> well, um, you answered the question. That's a fact. We have maxed out the dividend as you have seen. But let's see. Whatever is possible, we'll keep doing to uh, make it a little better financial structure. But in today's circumstances, I think slightly extra cash is not a bad problem to have. No, no, absolutely. So, Akhil, okay, you know, on the same point, uh, is there an opportunity in any one of these new streams like smart cities where uh, there could be uh, some heavy investments being made over a period of time uh, to reach the optimal gearing? Well, the way the smart city projects are coming up, I don't expect the possibility of a big investment all of a sudden. They will keep coming up, but then, of course, as you see, we have very solid free cash flow, which keeps adding to it. So I don't think that any of these new projects like uh, smart cities will uh, all of a sudden consume a massive amount of uh, capex. Got it. And just a follow-up on DS. So DS, you know, I you know, hear you on, you know, uh, what all the three telcos are doing. Let me put my question the other way around. So what happens to these extra towers? So let's say each of the top three ends up going maybe to 200, 250K, but still the number of towers in the industry is 450 to 500K, maybe with the smaller telcos. So all these towers with zero tenants, you know, eventually they will be, what, more than 200,000? What happens to them? The zero tenant towers has to be brought down. That's the very obvious thing. Wherever it is in vicinity of another tower, and particularly if it's in the Infratel, we've made that case earlier that for an operator, it is economically cheaper in the long run to go on a tower where there is an existing tenant. And if he's going more likely as a third tenant in the case of Indus Intratel, our tenancy ratios being north of two, any tenant who's coming in in these towers is more likely to be the third. The price he pays not only on the rental but also on energy is going to be significantly lower over the entire period. So it does not make sense to have two towers standing next to each other, particularly with a zero tenant tower. So the choice would be to dismantle those towers and in some cases where operators have gone bankrupt and there were large exposures, we've seen that happen too. Operators, there is a running cost of paying the tenant and also that asset getting, uh, you know, kind of damaged if it's lying unused there in these locations. So one has to dismantle some of these towers. On the analogy front, I think we did refer earlier about China Telecom and operators thereof where there are, you know, in excess of 1.5 million towers from leading operators there. And that's all macro that we're looking at. Small cells, in building, those are growth areas that we're not looking at right now. Uh, we only created more pilots and trial deployments for them. So we still see a lot of growth coming in. And some of these could be newer types of towers, as we said, or could be solutions which are specific, catering to the buildings where the coverage for data in particular is weaker. Yeah, no, I agree on China Towers, but again, the tenancy out there is, you know, very low, you know, 1.2, 1.3 kind of thing. Anyways, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Salgaonkar. The next question comes from Mr. Manish Adukya from Goldman Sachs, Mumbai. Mr. Adukya, you may ask your question now. 
Yes, hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my first question is somewhat related to your previous response, uh, DS. So if you can just comment on, you know, the impact on your company due to consolidation in the tower space per se. Uh, so ATC continues to expand its tower portfolio through inorganic route. And on the other hand, you have some of the peers like GTL and Ryan and Sattel who seem to be under pressure. So have you seen so far any impact whatsoever on Bharti in Sattel, positive or negative, due to the ongoing tower consolidation? That's the first question. And my second question, again, somewhat related to the earlier response, um, what are the kind of conversations right now you're having with your leading customers in terms of rentals? Are they, for example, trying to negotiate for lower rentals? And directionally, do you see rentals per tenant moving up or down over time, X of inflation escalation? Thank you. So, first, in terms of impact, tower consolidation, in a way, is good. That way, uh, you know, we will have operators of similar scale and size, and the market clearly is heading towards a consolidated scenario, too. For an operator, too, it is good. One less governance is to do. A uniform launch of product and services would be faster. That's an advantage that comes in. Second, uh, two operators, smaller size competing is worse than having one large operator compete with you. Again, I mentioned earlier, tower capacity is a not fungible capacity. That means whatever is an overlap between those two, those towers would have to come down uh, after the merger that happens because these are in pretty much the same geographic area that the mergers are happening. And hence, overlap towers would come out, and that is when they would be able to take their tenancy ratios up. We do not see that causing any change in the competitive scenario, if that is what you were referring to earlier, because those towers vary which way there. Uh, some of them would probably inch up to a higher tenancy ratio, provided they do consolidation between the two towers. In terms of price impact and negotiation with operators, yes, their balance sheets are stretched. This is a constant thing that goes on. Operators try and see if they can negotiate and get better terms on every opportunity that they have. But the industry has been by and large stable for the years that we've seen, because on a bill versus buy, still it is far cheaper to go in for a tower uh, on a shared basis with an IP1 as of today. So till that time that barrier is breached, we don't see that to be a potential uh, challenge for any of the tower companies there. In terms of uh, operators that have kind of gone bankrupt or, uh, you know, have got into uh, a territory, again, deep discounting does not help. And I said that in my earlier answer where I said if you, even if you go in as a first tenant into a tower which is potentially gone zero tenant, firstly, the requirement might not be there. That is why that tower has remained as, as a one tenant or a zero tenant tower by the other of course. And B, the cost over the life of the contract that one fulfills is going to be significantly higher too. Especially <coughs> the energy cost. Yes, the energy reason. So even if somebody was to compromise on rental, on energy, the actual cost versus the charge of, say, a second tenant, will just kill that uh, tower company. Right. And just if I can follow up on, on the uh, comment around tower consolidation. Now, ATC, of course, has grown its portfolio over the last couple of years in a meaningful manner here in India. And for them, um, you know, a large chunk of their revenues today come from outside of the top telcos. So uh, do you see any activity from them which seem to suggest maybe they may be getting more competitive? I understand that existing capacity is not fungible, but for new tower or tenancy demand, for example, do you see them competing more aggressively with your customers or nothing has really changed there? We haven't seen a change as of yet. Uh, the market itself is a little subdued, as you must have seen from the numbers too. The big focus from operators is loading 3G, 4G, more so 4G on their existing towers and complete their footprint. So we've been doing far more amount of loading over the last two quarters than the new builds. And our, if our new build numbers are indicative, I don't have data on public domain to, to compare and give you an absolute number, but we do not see a change on ground, which is significantly different than what we have seen in the past. Sure. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you very much, Mr. Adukya. The next question comes from Mr. Kunal Vora from BNP Paribas, Mumbai. Mr. Vora, you may ask your question now. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Our first question... Uh, can you explain the average rental per tenant and why it is not moving up? Uh, see, there are a few factors which should impact it positively, which includes exits and uh, resultant increase for remaining tenants. There is annual escalation of 2.5% which will be charging for new business, and there is 4G loading which is happening at a great pace. So all of these factors should uh, increase your average rental per tenant, but we haven't seen that impact. Is there any factor which is uh, 
weighing on it. That's question number one. And second question is on idea would of own. Have you had any discussions with them regarding exits and uh, is there any way you can, uh, especially regarding exit penalties, you had any discussions? Is there a way that can be waived or lowered? That's it. Two questions. So on average revenue per tenant, if you look at it uh, clearly, I think, you know, uh, directionally, I, I agree with you, it should move off, and it is actually moving in that direction, but, you know, because of certain other factors which happen, uh, you know, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, we don't, we are not able to see it from that perspective. You know, like uh, this particular quarter, let's say there was an ASL churn which led to a bit of a drop happening because, you know, uh, the while the venues weren't there, but in terms of, you know, the total co-locations, the complete exit happened. Whereas, from an average sharing perspective, you know, those co-locations or tenancies were still there in the December one. Plus, uh, otherwise, you know, uh, directionally, I think uh, they should be in Chicago. Okay. So, should we be expecting to increase sorry. going forward? Sorry. Yeah. Kunal, just to add, if you look at our year-on-year -year numbers where we are trying to do averaging on, on these numbers, you will see that uh, there is a significant uptick on, on the revenue per tenant that you see there. Whereas on a quarter-on-quarter, -quarter, as Pankaj said, there are aberrations and hence you are able to see some of those looking in, in divergence to the long-term trend. Okay, understood. Going forward, what should we, what should we expect? Uh, should uh, average rental is something which we should expect will increase uh, uh, let's say it's been statish. Uh, should we expect? Should we be building an improvement going forward? See, at this point of time, I think uh, because of uh, the consolidation and a bit of a subduedness happening, I think we should see a similar trend. But directionally, once it settles down, we should see the inching up. Yeah, but if the tendencies go up, then it surely it could come down a bit. Yeah, so sure. the direct correlation as the tenancy ratio is moving up. It is in, in uh, you know, pure mass, it's supposed to come down. As you rightly said, loading is a kicker up, and, and also the escalator that comes in are the two kickers that came in, come in. Uh, we are hoping whenever maximum MIMO deployment starts, that could be uh, a loading uh, revenue that will start to be the next, uh, you know, loading revenue increase that we are likely to see there. Understood. Great. Uh, second question, sir. On uh, what idea, there are no discussions as yet on any of the exits nor, uh, you know, their plans. So they are still not shared their plans going forward. Uh, last, as per paper report, they are waiting for a DOD approval, and we are uh, making a guess that post that there will be engagement with our companies on the way But they do not know how their integration is happening as yet. yet. When do they start rationalizing the towers? But on exit penalties, can, can there be any second thoughts or like it's a given, like they have to just pay? If, if they exit a few sites, they have to pay or is there a scope for a renegotiation? Exit, by the contract, yes, they have to pay. If there is other compelling propositions that are there, we are happy to look at that and, and look at options which are a win-win for an operator and we clearly see what idea is one of those long-term operators there. Uh, we could look at those options. And just uh, like one, one more question if you can. Uh, uh, is all the pain pertaining to the weaker operators behind now, Arcom, Airsel, Tata, Telenor, is there anything left now, uh, like at the end of fiscal 18? I understand idea would often will be still like, uh, will the impact we'll see in FY19, but on uh, other, op other weaker operators, are we, are we like, done, done with it? Yeah, most of it is done, except uh, Uninorp, which is also waiting for the final leg of uh, you know, integration to uh, with Airtel. Understood, okay. That's it for my Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Vora. The next question comes from Mr. Rajiv Sharma from HSBC Mumbai. Mr. Sharma, you may ask your question now. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just two questions from my side. Uh, firstly, is there any scope at Infratel or Indus level to reduce the number of towers given the exits or the potential exits which may be underway? And if you can quantify uh, the VODA idea or potential impact, uh, I understand it could be spread over four to eight quarters, but um, given that they define 60,000 as, you know, towers where they are co-located, how much this would be in Indus and Infratel? Thank you. On the uh, towers that are to be dismantled, as an ongoing business, we, no. we normally look at towers which are coming down on zero tenant, but for Infratel and Indus in particular, we have no towers that are coming up for dismantling on account of 
any of the exists. We have not built towers for, uh, I should say, other than the leading operators in the past, and hence our exposure is negligible to any of uh, these exists that come in in any of the locations there. So, Goda idea. Rajiv, on Goda idea, you know, uh, while we, we don't have the specific numbers, you know, but looking at the way uh, Goda idea talked about these tenancies which you are just saying, and if we go back and look at the, uh, the cars on which the common tenancies coexist, uh, our estimate is, you know, maybe we'll have somewhere around 20 to 25,000 tenancies, which there is a possibility of this getting impacted. Now, honestly, we don't know the timing, and hence it can get like actually get, you know, uh, coming on or spilled over across uh, multiple years, so to say. But uh, I think that's what uh, the estimate we believe is there at this point of time. Well, there 60,000 alley also included the towers in infrared circle with the soul. Because practically on those, they were both there. Yeah, so this 25K uh, tenancies, this is at the console level or it is at index level? This is at the console level, Rajiv. Thank you. That answers my question. And uh, any outlook on the CAPEX number, uh, you know, what we should see next year? And uh, if I can understand where is the CAPEX happening, with this massive MIMO, we, will we need more CAPEX? Or because that is, you know, one potential trigger, it seems like, in urban centers. So will there be uh, some CAPEX requirement or it could be done without uh, any major incremental CAPEX? On, on massive MIMO, we don't expect a huge amount of capex there, but yes, it's marginally higher than a standard capex that we put for loading on, on the towers, but not very significant. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma. Participants who wish to ask questions may please press star 1. The next question comes from Mr. Pranav Shatriya from Edelweiss, Mumbai. Mr. Shatriya, you may ask your question now. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, uh, can you comment on uh, Indus acquisitions? Uh, you know, the, where are we currently uh, in, in that uh, uh, you know discussion? Uh, can we see anything coming uh, through in uh, you know next uh, few months? Uh, that's my first question. Uh, secondly, uh, you said that uh, Uninor uh, is uh, one of the tenant, uh, you know, the, for whom uh, tenancy cancellation is pending. Can you quantify how much uh, is it pending? Uh, and third question is, uh, if we look at the gross tenancy addition for the last two quarters, you know, that translates into roughly 4% annualized uh, tenancy addition uh, 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 currently which is significantly below 8% what was done in last year, uh, that is FY17. So, uh, and this is also coming at a peak capex. Uh, so, how should we be uh, seeing this, uh, uh, you know, panning out uh, in the coming years? Uh, you expect this to accelerate if yes, you know, what should drive the growth? Uh, thank you. So, to first to answer your question, we do not give operating loans for specific numbers, so I'm sorry, I'll not be able to give you, you know, specific numbers there. On uh, gross additions, your yeah, observation is right. Uh, we've said that the last two quarters, particularly towards the end of the year, have been softer, and that is primarily because incumbents were going through, uh, uh, you know, either consolidation or integration or, uh, you know, 4G rollout to a great extent to mat match up on the capacity requirements on 4G. We hope that this trend will reverse from there on. The first two quarters, of course, were, were significantly higher too, and that's why, in fact, the fall looks even more steeper. But we hope that these growth rates will come back going forward once all this uh, integration activity and the basic 4G coverage on nearly 100% of the existing sites by incumbent is done, there will be an addition of, of new sites that would come up. On specifics on Indus, so, uh, uh, you know, Indus, Infratel, <clears throat> merger remains a potential. It's always a possibility. But as you can imagine, these are shareholders' matters, and therefore, as Infratel, we are not in a position to comment much on this. Uh, sir, if I can just uh, follow up uh, on the second uh, answer, 
uh, I mean, uh, what exactly is uh, leading to, you know, significantly lower uh, tenancy addition uh, in the last, uh, two quarters. Is it uh, because of uh, the newer operator not really contributing as much as it was contributing in the last year or uh, there is something else to it? So the two drivers of growth in the past were of course uh, the leading operators, Airtel, Vodafone, Idea doing their bit of tenancy additions and of course the kicker was coming in on account of Geo doing significantly higher in the first quarter. We've seen Geo go between phases. They had completed their earlier phase by the end of second quarter and they are in the uh, planning phase for the next phase of rollout, which is what they've announced, and we're hoping to get our fair share of that business as we move forward. On uh, Voda Idea, as I said, they are more focused, while they still continue to roll out, but their focus on new rollout is significantly lower over their emphasis of bringing in 4G, and that is what is coming in as large part of CapEx addition. In terms of perspective, we probably need the highest amount of cabinet expansions in the last year that we've ever done in our individual history as Indazo Infratel. So that's the kind of rollout that's going on to make sure that all their existing sites come up to a 4G offering in all the locations that they are present in. But Brav, another thing, you know, if you look at even on a full year basis, the gross additions are still in a similar range, you know. We have done 18,000 uh, last year and maybe close to 17,000 which happened. So, you know, there is a... While you look at quarter on quarter, sorry. There is a marked difference in H1 and H2. That's why, you know, uh, yeah. I'm a little concerned on the trajectory of uh, the growth. Anyways, thank you so much. Uh, very helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Shatriya. Participants who wish to ask questions may please press star 1. The next question comes from Mr. Akshin Thakkar from Fidelity, Mumbai. Mr. Thakkar. You may ask your question now. Yeah, uh, guys, just one basic question on CapEx. Uh, if we just look at on a consolidated basis, uh, the CapEx more or less has remained in the 2,000 crore uh, levels for the last four, five years, but the number of power ads uh, that you've done in the last four, five years has been progressively coming down. So if you then impute CapEx per tower, uh, and I'm only looking at growth because you sort of call out maintenance capex separately on a console basis, uh, which again has been around four five hundred crores. So fifteen hundred crores for progressively lower and lower amount of uh, capex. Uh, is there a change in the kind of towers that you're putting up, and is that like the right number to go work with going forward? No, there isn't. You know. Uh, any change which has happened in terms of the tower design, and uh, I think the way uh, the CapEx is happening in terms of the gross colo is more or less running at uh, similar trend. Average CapEx, what we have seen is more or less for each of the new tenancy data, towers is relatively at a similar level, and hence directionally it would be better if we continue with the same stuff. We aren't seeing any major change, so to say. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, the incremental tenancies has nothing to do with your capex and growth front, right? That has to do with towers. And your number of tower ads has been coming off every year. So, so, so incremental tenancy also, you know, it's not only a towers wherein you incur a capex. There is a uh, minor capex, so to say, as compared to a new tower, which still happens uh, on each tenancy too. You know, because there are batteries to be upgraded and beyond a certain number of operators on certain side, there are DG sets to be upgraded which then is a very, you know, a smaller percentage as compared to what you see on a new tower completely. Okay. All right. That was the only question I had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thakkar. The next question comes from Mr. Aniladh Gangahar from Namura, Mumbai. Mr. Gangahar, you may ask your question now. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, is there any CapEx guidance for this financial year, vis uh, vis last year? And secondly, for this year as well, do we expect uh, any changes in the kind of uh, energy EBITDA margins that we would tend to have or is the guidance remaining around 5 to 6% as has been the case for the last few years? Uh, those are my two questions. Thank you. Well, you know, while, uh, you know, we don't give the specific numbers, but in more in terms of a capex, depending upon the 
the new volumes, uh, I think traditionally the kind of averages we have been incurring in the past should be a, a, a better number to take even for a current year because we don't see anything changing on that front and we are hopeful that much kind of investment would still be required. More in terms of EBITDA margins, you know, uh, I think there is a continuous effort in terms of uh, optimizing, the, you know, the network and then trying to make sure we try and get the maximum margin. So directionally by quarter on quarter you will see these, uh, you know, the margin is increasing. But in terms of an overall year approach, as you know, there are uh, rising research which happen every year. So even post that, there are more energy initiatives which happen in terms of further investments, electrification and everything. And hence, uh, on a buy on wire basis, I think for a modeling, uh, for 5 to 7% would should still be a better number to be considered. Uh, thank you. I mean, I was just uh, curious because now the industry structure is also changing. and it'll, this is a kind of a transition year for a lot of things. Uh, so could there be some more pressure from the operators given that uh, most of them seem to be, uh, you know, heading southward as far as margins are concerned? Um, if I can skip one other question, again, from the commentary for the last two quarters, we've been expecting the second phase of GEO uh, to kick in um, for the last now six to nine months or so, six, six months precisely. Any, any color? Uh, incrementally as to whether we are close to it or we still, it's a bit of a waiting game here. Can't comment about specific customers and their plans at this stage. I'm sorry about that. We'll have to just, uh, you know, as, as business flows in, we are happy, we are ready in terms of capability and also uh, you know, teams being ready to roll out with our partners. So we wait for uh, whatever time operators want us to focus on either new rollouts or tenancy additions or cabinet expansions. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gangahar. The next question comes from Mr. Srinivas Rao from Deutsche Bank, Singapore. Mr. Rao, you may ask your question now. Hi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I had a question on your uh, the lease rentals, minimum lease rentals and the lease period. Uh, that has been trending down. Uh, no, given the new uh, you know, pricing framework which you had uh, you know, done uh, about a year back now, wherein it's getting harmonized under the rate card approach, would that would this minimum lease rental and the minimum lease period continue to trend down for the next couple of years, like each like maybe two years or something? Just want to understand that. Shri, can you repeat your question? We couldn't hear you very clearly. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, sorry, I was saying that the minimum lease, you know, period and the minimum lease rentals, contracted rentals, that, that data which you provide every quarter, uh, that, that, that has been trending down. I just want to understand, will it continue to trend down for the next, uh, say, two to three years? Uh, or it, at some point it will start to rise again? So, again, Shri, Pankaj side, you know, so that, that's a function of the incremental tenancies coming in, you know, earlier... That period, uh, you know, you had uh, contracted uh, or contracts which were still running for 15 years, and as you know, you know now, you know, the uh, all, almost all the new contracts are coming with a tenure of 10 years. So as we see, depending upon the volume, uh, it's it's an impact of that 15 to 10, which is uh, bringing it down from that perspective. So as volumes start ramping up, we should ideally see then this number rises, flattish or going up. And just to clarify, all your new tenancies, even with incumbent operators, are are a ten year frame, right? Ten year uh, time frame, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Rao. The next question comes from Mr. Gabor Sitani from Fiera Capital, London. Mr. Sitani, you may ask your question now. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Um, just uh, wanted to get an idea about the long-term uh, top-line growth rate once the dust settles and, and the um, idea of Vodafone um, uh, consolidation happens from that new base. If you look out the next uh, sort of three to five years, perhaps if you can reconstruct uh, a top-line growth rate in terms of the various layers, uh, tar rollout, how do you see the tenancies, and because of the rate card, how, rate card, how the um, uh, 
tenancy rates going up, what what kind of top line growth would that add up to? Uh, that's uh, on a sustainable basis. That's my first question. The second one, if and when the infratel in this merger happens, um, have you looked at it? What kind of cost saving uh, would that make possible, if any? Thanks. So, hi, this is D.S. Ravat. As a company, we don't give guidance on, on future plans, but from an ambition standpoint, we will clearly look at uh, the historical trends that we've done in the last five, six years. If we look at the CAGR growths, we hope to replicate those over the next five to six year period too. Uh, and this is from our tower business that, that we are working on as we speak. Um, well, on um, the potential uh, merger, if one wants to theoretically think of Indus Infratel, I think besides some cost saving, which could be 40, 50, 60 crores a year perhaps, um, I think the major saving could be in TGT, the dividend distribution tax. There is also a possibility of, you know, since the capex will become a combined one, economies of scale. Some economies of scale. So about 500 crores is a dividend distribution tax which is uh, paid yeah. by us. Understand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sitani. At this moment, there are no further questions from participants. I would now hand over the call proceedings to Mr. D. S. Rawat for the final remarks. Thank you. As I can cite it, the telecom industry has seen an unprecedented consolidation which led to five operators exiting during the year. As a result, we saw negative net additions for the first time at Infratel on a full year basis. Nonetheless, remaining operators are focusing on the data strategy, ensuring a strong 4G pan-India presence. We have said it before and still believe that consolidation is good for the industry in the long run, as it will lead to stronger and stable operators doing faster nationwide rollout. We have closed the year with consolidated revenue of Rs. 14,490 crores and EBITDA of 6,427 crores, both growing at 8% year-on-year. Going ahead, we believe operators would want to monetize the increasing data consumption and look to improve the quality of service. We are best placed to capitalize on this opportunity by playing a key role in building and sharing vital telecom infrastructure with all customers on a non-discriminatory basis. On behalf of the entire Bharti Infotel team, I thank you all for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you, sir.